Hello, everyone. I'm Asimina Berku, Head of Education for BGCI, and I would like to welcome you all to the uh, fourth Communities in Nature webinar. The aim of this series is to create a space for the leading professionals working in the area of social justice and inclusion to share their expertise to support others to grow their social role of their sites, botanic gardens and other museums. We are honored to have NICAP, Manager Foundation from the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria, and Sharon Willoughby, Manager of the Public Programs from Carmel Garden, Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. Nick Up has uh, 13 years of experience in sales, and then he moved his career in uh, fundraising for red privileged communities in the developing world, and has been now working as a manager of the fundraising team at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria, for the last four and a half years. Nick is passionate about engaging and connecting with donors in a meaningful way. Shadow has worked uh, for the same garden since 1999. Very impressive. Your uh, long-term experience in the gardens. And from 2003, she managed public programs at Cranbourne Gardeners, developing the visitor experience in the award-winning Australian garden and the Cranbourne Bushland through placemaking, interpretation planning, and the development of a team dedicated to socially inclusive partnerships. Sharon has a background in ecological science and is currently working on a PhD in environmental history, so lots of expertise in our speakers today. In a second, I will introduce you to Nick and Sharon, but first, I would like to just explain the format of this webinar. Nick and Sharon will be giving a presentation about their work, and this will include uh, talking about the general approach to fundraising, followed by three case studies. So now Nick and Sharon will talk to you about uh, fundraising for community projects. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Asimina. Uh, should we start off with the poll question? The first question, does your garden have staff dedicated to fundraising or donor management? If so, how many? All right. Well, maybe we'll launch into the first thing that we were going to um, talk to you about, which is um, what the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria's general approach or philosophy behind the way that we raise corporate and philanthropic money. And Nick, who is the manager of our foundation, which is the area where we look after fundraising, is best place to talk about that. So over to you, Nick. Thank you, Sharon, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, it's great to be uh, sharing with you um, through this uh, wonderful uh, medium of technology that we have. Just to give you a little bit of background to the way that we work, and I understand that you each come from um, different environments and different sized organisations. so. I think one of the things to keep in mind when I'm sharing, we're sharing what we have to share is uh, are the, the principles that, we, um, uh, that we're talking about um, because I think the principles apply across organisations regardless of the size of the organisation. So the way that we go about our, our fundraising, if you like, the, 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 the principle um, that we work from is one of building relationships. That's the most important thing. So we don't look at engaging thousands of people. We look at engaging just a small number of people and building long-term relationships that go for years. And our hope and our aim is to have our supporters, our close supporters, eventually leave um, a bequest in their will to us. That's our, that's our ultimate aim. But before we get to that point, we want them to make donations along the way. Now, as an organisation, we have about 400 to, 450 to 500 people who donate to us every year. Most of our supporters come from around um, our Melbourne gardens. So we have two gardens uh, that come under the banner of Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria. Melbourne Gardens, which is close to the central business district of Melbourne in Australia, and Cranbourne Garden, Gardens, which is where Sharon spends most of her time and we have long-term relationships with a number of supporters who live within walking distance of the gardens and in fact a lot of them walk through the gardens every day and interact with our staff and so it's um, it's very important that our staff um, are happy to engage with those people because they ask lots of questions and um, and that's all part of building relationships in that regardless of which staff member supporters come into contact with 
they feel like they're part of the organisation. And, uh, and so our staff are very good at doing that. So our, our aim is to build relationships which bring value to both the botanic gardens and also to the donor. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's for the botanic gardens, it's about raising money. But for our donor, they have some very personal reasons that they might engage with us. And it's important that we try and understand what are the reasons that they want to engage with us. And it might be because they have an interest in horticulture, they may have an interest in science or a particular area of science or botany. Um, they may have an interest in landscape design. And it's important for us to try and find out what that area of interest is and then find a way for us to fulfill that area of interest. And, and so we may have various projects um, in, in the area of science um, that we can connect our supporters into. And, and then we may do that through bringing them on tours through the gardens. So the gardens tries to fulfill the desires of our supporters and we need to nurture that and respect that and it although most of our supporters are individuals or couples the same principles about building relationships with our um, with supporters also applies to community groups who support us uh, trusts and foundations who support us or corporations that support us so we try to apply the same principles regardless of who we engage with build a relationship for the long term that brings value to both the gardens and to that supporter. So that's our general philosophy. Sharon, I'll now hand back to you. So Nick, it sounds like um, a lot of your work is about creating relationships. That's correct, yep. Yeah. So the relationships are the key of it. Uh, the, next, the next poll is, do you have a list of actual and potential supporters for your garden but in the in the meantime does anyone have any questions about that first section okay our first case study is a cautionary tale the problem with buying lists and cold calling supporters so this relates to an experience that you had Nick that's that's right Sharon and uh, I guess coming from um, what I've just been talking about uh, our approach is very much about building relationships with supporters. And we actually, a couple of years ago, decided to break that golden rule because we thought, well, we haven't got many supporters around our Cranbourne gar gardens. And uh, as I mentioned, we have two gardens, Melbourne Gardens and Cranbourne, and we wanted to build the number of supporters around our Cranbourne gardens. So we went out and we... we um, bought a list so in australia you can buy lists of people and then you can segment those lists into different demographics by their income level by their education level uh, by their interest areas and so we uh, we bought a list that um, fitted a demographic that we thought was appropriate to the gardens now that cost us twelve thousand dollars to buy that list and then to have a um, uh, a letter sent out to those people, to those households, those eight and a half thousand households, and um, seeking their support for Cranbourne Gardens in particular. So we broke our rule of building relationships for the long term because we thought we just want to build our numbers. We lost we, we lost our way a little bit. And the, the salutary lesson from this is that send, we sent out um, letters to eight and a half thousand households. Now, typically with this sort of approach, you would expect a, um, a response from about two and a half percent of those 8,000. Our response ended up being 0.0165, I think it was. We had 13 responses um, and it, it, it yielded about $2,000. So whilst we weren't expecting to um, make money on it. We were hoping to cover our costs, but in the end, we lost about $10,000 on it. And it just reminded us that the way that we can operate best is to build relationships. And we do that by starting with who we know. So a more appropriate way would have been for Cranbourne Gardens was to act, would have been to actually start with the staff and the supporters at Cranbourne Gardens and say, who do you know? Um, instead, 
we took, I guess, a more expedient approach. Um, and in the end, it cost us $10,000. Um, it got us 13 supporters who we didn't have, which that's a good thing. Um, but uh, it fell well below expectations. Um, and it, it really talked to the fact that the way that we work best is to take a long-term view don't expect to get a big donation or any donation within you know within a short period of time but connect with people find out what their area of interest is in the gardens build on that area of interest and then invite them to support the gardens at an appropriate time and so the lesson there is whilst it, it, there was a sense of the grass looks green over there um, I think it's good to stick to what you do well and the way that we operate well and that I would encourage other um, organisations like yours is to go and build relationships and take a long-term view. Thanks Nick. So Frodo has um, put in a question for us which is how do you encourage or well, how do you encourage all staff to engage in the relationship with donors or in fact do we? Good question. Yeah Frodo. It, it is Frodo and, and thank you thank you for that question. Um, I, th I think you need to actually um, provide education to staff. Um, now we, we're, we're quite a big gardens and we have over 200 staff um, but it's often about actually asking uh, or, or explaining to the staff the value because sometimes people don't appreciate the value that um, fundraising actually brings and so if you can demonstrate to them the value that it brings to their area of um, or their job um, uh, I've I found that people are more interested in in, uh, in, in playing a, um, a donor engagement role and uh, and then also providing them with the tools. So it's not just expecting them to be able to engage with donors when they walk through the gardens, it's actually providing them with the tools to do that. And so that might be if you have a particular project that you're trying to raise funds for, provide them with the information about that project. If, um, if they're very knowledgeable people but might, might be a little bit shy and, and not have actually um, you know, wouldn't typically speak with people, perhaps even help train them in engaging with people as people walk through the gardens. Um, so I think it really comes down to education and also encouraging. And I've found that with our, with our staff, um, particularly a number of our scientists who, who are very, uh, very competent, very knowledgeable in what they do, but they don't often get out and engage with people um, and, and actually share what they do. And, um, and then when we've encouraged them, we've provided them with uh, a bit of support, um, we've had some wonderful outcomes. And what we find is that, in fact, the, the supporters don't really want to engage with me as a fundraiser. They want to engage with the staff who know what they're talking about. Um, I just become the, 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 uh, the bridge uh, between the organisation and the supporter. And so it's really important, that's why it's really important, to connect supporters in with the expert staff, such as Sharon in her area of public programs, or one of our scientists and one of our horticulturalists. Um, and once again, it's it's not a quick thing. You've got to be prepared to take a long-term view and, uh, and, and just work at it, but have a plan. Have a plan about educating staff and encouraging staff. Okay. Uh, Tamara, you've said um, that you haven't started fundraising yet, but you have a foundation that supports you um, and that just lately um, you started going out to the community um, looking at fundraising directly from the community and you're wondering if um, we've gone directly to the community for donations apart from I guess the cold calling that you talk you spoke about for Cranbourne mm. um, I think it's been a long time since the garden ran a community direct small donation campaign yes yes it, yes it is um, it's a good question Tamara um, I, what I would encourage you is to once again um, uh, work on the fact if you're talking about people around the gardens the local community around the gardens um, I would hope that they would have some sort of affinity with the gardens so that gives you a starting point um, but things like uh, letterbox drops um, uh, can be a good way to start or even staff that might even know staff or or supporters um, who may know other people in that area and so it's working through your networks to engage with those uh, with those people who are around you um, in the absence of having those connections and networks I would suggest you start with people around the gardens 
and you do a letterbox drop because they have a they have an affinity by purely because of their proximity. So that it comes back to not just um, going out to uh, going out anywhere, but sort of so being strategic about it and saying who may have a connection, even if it's a little bit re remote in some regards. Um, and proximity is usually a pretty good place to start. Right, the next, the next case study is from me and um, we've got a PowerPoint that we're going to email out to you. It was just a little bit too much for the webinar system to deal with showing you the PowerPoint as well as us talking. Um, but what I want to talk to you is about finding project partners. So um, I just, you may or may not have seen this publication which is available um, to download from the BGCI website under resources. Uh, it's called Caring for Your Community, a Manual for Botanic Gardens. And in there, there's a case study about a project that we ran here at Cranburn, uh, the ultimate outcome of which was the creation of a playgroup for young Indigenous children. But I wanted to talk a little bit about how we found partners for our social inclusion project and how that ultimately um, ended up with us being able to find funding for that project. Uh, the public programs branch at uh, Cranburn goes to lots of meetings with the local government area that we sit within and when various community groups have planning days or festivals we try to go to as many of these uh, events as we can manage. One of the reasons that we go is it allows us to network with our local community. It's important to know the people who run the local churches, um, who runs the mothers groups, uh, who the maternal health care nurses are, uh, who are on the parents committees on schools, that sort of information. It became clear to us about two years ago that there were a number of groups within our community that had shared values and objectives around literacy. So our, our local library, uh, its mission is to increase literacy in our local community. The city of Casey looked at the school scores for all the primary schools in our region and found that literacy was very low in our community compared to other areas of the big city that we live in. Uh, as a botanic garden, we're obviously interested in increasing literacy around the environments and plants in our community. Uh, in a way, we're all about sharing uh, plant blindness. And you can see on the right hand side that Liliana has put up a link to the BGC eye manual, which I think you'll find really useful. Also, our local Indigenous community, the Bunurong people, the Bunurong elders were very concerned that not only were their young struggling with literacy in English, they weren't learning any Bunurong words, traditional language, and therefore they were finding that young people had difficulty accessing Bunurong culture. So it was clear that we all had these objectives that lined up around literacy. We decided to get together and meet to talk about this shared objective, to brainstorm ways in which we could improve local literary, literacy outcomes for our community. And one of the, um, I guess, key decisions that we made was that we would invest whatever time and funding that we could find in the early childhood area. So in Australia, that means zero to eight years of age. And most often it means zero to four. So those years before children uh, go to school. One of the great things about getting together as a group, so that's a, a picture of us sitting in the bush at our first steering group meeting. It then meant that after the meeting, we had eight or 10 different eyes out there in the community watching for funding opportunities to become available. And one of, one of those great moments of serendipity, the Department of Education in Victoria decided to make funding available for play groups. So that's informal groups of early childhood um, children and families 
they were providing money for a facilitator to run those groups. And we had the information ready to go to pitch to government that we would create a play group for early childhood. We had the structure in place pretty quickly to provide governance for that money. So while it's very much a community driven project, the Botanic Gardens has taken on administration of the money as the auspicing body. But it's just an example of finding partners who have shared values and objectives can sometimes make it easier to find money for projects. Any thoughts on that, Nick? Uh, I, I, th I think uh, what Sharon has spoken about there is, is, is absolutely spot on. Uh, it's about working with people who have a shared interest and shared um, shared value in what you're 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 doing, and and I think um, when you consider how you might engage with potential supporters of your organisation, it's about looking for those people who do have that shared interest um, in what you're doing, shared interest in your mission and vision, and where you as an organisation are going, and um, I think as Sharon has alluded to in her her example, um, she worked with people who she knew and who had, who had that shared interest. And so it's really starting with who you know. And so when you're out there looking for people to support your organisation, try and look for people who you know. And when I, when I talk about who you know, who have a shared interest, uh, it doesn't mean that you're best friends with them, but it means that they may be people who have an interest in the work that you do. Uh, Just before we go on to the next section, um, there's another botanic garden in Australia, Adelaide Botanic Garden in South Australia. They've, um, they've used a similar but slightly different approach in that they decided that they would um, set up a medicinal garden. They had a small amount of money from one funder and then what they did was they actively looked at all the government agencies and community groups of a particular size within their region that shared values around medicinal plants and community health. And then they actually pitched their project to yeah. the funders specifically. And their presentation paid particular attention to showing how the values of the two organisations lined up, but also how if that organisation supported their project, it would help them cover off on some of their corporate objectives, mm. which I think was a, a clever approach. Absolutely. So Nick um, is now going to talk to us a little bit more about um, where to look for funds, um, individuals, foundations, government groups, government and corporates. Where do you look? And, and I'm conscious too that these are all um, groups that are familiar to us that uh, may not necessarily be familiar to you, but they are all different sources of funding that we as an organisation seek, um, seek to engage with. Uh, and so the principle that we use, once again, is uh, starting with who we know. And, and a really good thing to think about, particularly for organisations that do have limited resource in this area, and, and to certain degrees, we all have limited resource in the fundraising space, um, is to try and find those people who can be champions for you and who can actually go out and uh, who you can empower to go out and represent you and, um, and link into their networks uh, and so it's like it's like throwing a, a pebble into a pond and uh, you start and you have these concentric circles that get bigger and bigger of course when you throw the pebble into the pond and so you start with that small pebble and then you build networks around you that then network into other groups and other groups and so that principle I've found over the years to be a very successful one um, because I'm, I'm sure that um, if you're out looking for um, uh, some work to be done in your house um, and you want a tradesperson to come and work in your house, generally you will go and ask someone who, who's also had a tradesperson do work on their house for their recommendation. And it's a similar sort of principle. It's about asking for recommendations. And so that's why I always go back to that point about starting with who you know and who are connected to the gardens already and then um, asking them to connect into their, net, their networks who will have an interest in the gardens. So how do you do that? Well, it can be done through various means. Uh, it can be done simply by having meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with people. Uh, it can be done 
through information events, this is something we've found really successful, very small information events, so they don't need to be big, but it's just about asking a small group of people to come along to our herbarium and have a tour through the herbarium, uh, to come and hear one of our horticulturalists speak. Um, and often those groups might only be eight people, six people. Um, but it's a very intimate and uh, and a really good way of building relationships with people because they feel quite special that they have been asked to come into these small in, uh, to these small meetings uh, and to hear from the experts. Uh, how else can you, you connect in? Well, we talked before about um, if you if you don't have those networks, is using your local proximity uh, to um, uh, to the local community and doing things like letterbox drops and perhaps having a small event for the local community, which is not about fundraising. It's about sharing information about what you and, and your gardens or organisation are doing in the local community and how you're impacting the local community. Because that's what people are interested in. What's the impact that you're having? What value are you bringing to them? Um, and so I think one of the things to really consider is not to not to be thinking in terms of how much money can we get out of these people. It's actually what can we as a garden bring to these people. It's a slight change of mindset, but um, it, 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 I found that it has a far greater impact um, because it shows you have an interest in them and you're not just walking up to them or trying to engage with them to try and extract money from them. You actually want to bring something of value to them. Um, another way is actually uh, to, uh, to engage with people is to um, research on Google, research things like um, uh, trusts and foundations. Now, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, what that means to various to various participants uh, uh, on this webinar, but a trust and foundation in Australia is basically an organisation that's set up to provide funding to non-profit organisations, and, and often they can be very general. They can just have a big sum of money, and they give out um, a, a percentage every year or they can be very specific. They can be um, specific to environmental organisations or to um, poverty alleviation. They can be across a range of different areas that non-profit organisations service. So I think I know that, um, that we actually have organisations that provide lists of all the trusts and foundations um, uh, and also uh, gives you categories of those trusts and foundations. So you can actually narrow down a search in Google that will give you a list of trusts and foundations that have an interest in environmental botanic gardens um, uh, type organisations um, and then you can start to connect with those organisations because the, the, the connection is a shared value. Uh, once again, it's, it's, it, might, it might be, you know, a very, um, in some regards, tenuous because you may never, never have met them before, but at least you have shared values. And so I think the important thing to remember is don't just go out with a scattergun approach hoping that someone will open their wallet and give you some money. Be strategic about it. And at the very minimum, look for a connection to your gardens or to your organisation. And, and I think if you start from that premise, um, you'll have far greater success than if you just go out and send out lots of letters hoping that, that uh, one or two will hit the mark. Okay. So in Australia, Nick, one of the big organisations that sends out lists of potential donors, are they called Philanthropic or Philanthropy Australia, is that right? Philanthropy Australia is a, um, a, an overarching body uh, that is representative of trust and foundation. So it's sort of like the peak body, if yeah. you like. Yeah. And so there are those sorts of organisations that you can, um, that I'm assuming, I'm hoping that might, might be um, uh, also uh, also exist in your, your uh, part of the world. And so there are those sorts of bodies that you can tap into as well who can provide, uh, it's a good point, Sharon, who can provide assistance in connecting in to various funding organisations um, in your in your part of the world. Yeah. The other way that we get lists of potential small funding opportunities in Australia is our local member of parliament um, or our local politicians, so our local member of parliament and local government workers sometimes compile lists which they email out to us so their offices act like clearing houses for funding opportunities but they're usually for very small nuts and bolts um, projects okay well the next poll question maybe rather than running the poll 
um, we'll I can talk a little bit about it in the next section which is the last case study um, funding a social inclusion project uh, if you download the BGCI manual for botanic gardens there's some really useful information about putting projects together one of the things that I spoken that I spoke about earlier it's a short it's only a six six uh, the sides of six pages long document that talks about how do people access the garden here that we work in and it talks about the things that we've done to try and make the garden accessible so the fact that we have lots of seating that we have a lift for people with mobility issues that we're an equal opportunity employer that we use international symbols on signs that we've operated in partnership programs that provide access to special needs children so it the document outlined what we already do uh, projects that were underway but what we would like to do in the future and the sorts of things that we talked about we would like to do in the future is install a hearing loop in our auditorium so that people with hearing aids can plug directly into the sound system and that we wanted a fully accessible toilet so that's um, a toilet that provides an adult size change table uh, even though we live in a very big city there's actually only two other public um, adult fully accessible public toilets in Melbourne and um, having them increases the amount of time that significantly disabled people can spend away from home because they can spend a full day out roughing rather than having to duck back home so the document I guess outlined what we would like to do what we're doing why and what our aspirations for the future were and I found this document really really useful because if I would go to meetings um, with local council members or other groups looking at accessibility I could give them a very quick snapshot of our organization and where we were trying to go at the back of it there's a more extended case study which has some lovely photographs and more information about a project in this accessibility area that we'd already completed but it's more like a, a short story if you like it um, it was only I think yeah three or four sides but you know very evocative very easy to read and I found that it very quickly um, generated funding for us for the accessibility toilet and the way that that worked is I was at a meeting with an organization called Urella who um, administer a lot of money for government in the area of disability and their view was they could access funding that I couldn't access so they could access funding for a fully accessible toilet through a particular grant that government would make available to them but not to us but they could pass the money on to us so we formed a partnership we took the project to government and we got the money for our fully accessible toilet which wasn't an enormous amount of money it was somewhere between the very small grants that I was talking about from local government and the really very big big mm. grants you might get from philanthropic um, supporters and I think since then for all the different audiences that I work with in the gardens I've always had one of these aspiration papers I guess mm. is a good, good is a good name for it that outlines what we're trying to do with that audience where we're trying to go and what the barriers are to working with that audience that we need some money to to jump uh, so I'd encourage you to do that it's um, whether you do it just for yourself as a garden or for the partnership that you're forming it's a very powerful tool Tamara has put a question to us you are talking mostly about long-term relationships with the donor will it be a different approach as you see it for fundraising to a community a community specific project which is naturally less long-term mm. yeah it's a, it's a good question Tamara and um, the, the reason I talked about long-term is that uh, we have supporters who have 
supported a number of different projects, community, small projects and big projects, um, along the journey of their relationship with us. So by building the longer term relationships, you would actually look to engage those people in the short term. But what we're doing is taking a long term view of the relationship, saying we're not just looking to engage them to support this one project, we're actually looking years and years ahead and saying we want to keep this person as a supporter of the, of the gardens for as long as possible. And along the way we'll have projects such as what you've outlined there, a community project, which may be of interest to them. Now it's important for us to understand what their interests are. So there's no good, uh, it's no good us taking a community related project um, that uh, to a donor who has no interest in community projects, may have interest in a new building as for example as opposed to a community project so it's incumbent upon us to understand what our supporters uh, interest areas are but if you take a long-term view what it means is that when these other projects come up you've hopefully got a, a, a group of supporters there who you've been nurturing for a long time and you can just engage them in that particular project because you've been taking a long-term view and you've been nurturing that relationship all the way along I think uh, there's a an allied or another way to think about it um, is that as a botanic garden we're interested in being in relationship with our community mm. for the whole of their life and the whole of our life as an organization um, in Australia they talk about lifelong learning as an aspiration that government often has for our communities and in many ways as an organisation, we're offering our, our supporters and our donors lots of different relationships with us. They can be volunteers, they can join our friends group, they can work for us, with us, mm. they can become donors, they can leave us a bequest at the end of their life. So we're really, um, in all the areas in the gardens where we work with people, mm we share this goal of being in relationship with our community for the, for the, long, for the long term. Thanks for that question, mm. Tamara. And that flows into the next thing that we were going to talk about, which is maintaining relationships. So um, how do we go about, once those relationships are established mm. and we're getting money from donors, how much resource do we put into maintaining that relationship in the long term? Well, what I'd liken it to is if you have a friendship, um, do friendships just happen? You've got to put work into them to maintain those relationships, those friendships, if they're important to you and you'll devote time to it and you'll devote resource to it. It's the same with our donors. Um, if we're really serious about engaging them for the long term, we've got to take the time and the resource to continually engage them. So what does that look like? It means that if, if you have a donor who supports a community fundraising, a community project, that you make sure you report back to them on how that project's gone. You bring them along, show them the project, you provide them photos, you email them uh, how it's going as it, as it develops. Uh, it's really important to keep them in the loop. But you'd be amazed how often I've seen organisations receive funding from donors and then just forget them and then be surprised why that donor won't support them again. So it's really important that if people are, are, are providing, or organisations are providing their finances to support your project, that you keep them in the loop, you keep reporting back to them, um, you keep them engaged, and you keep valuing them. Um, what, what we often find, uh, and research has found this certainly in Australia, is that people sometimes just feel like they're like a, an automatic teller machine and non-profit organisations will come to them when they want money and they'll stick their card into the machine and out comes the money. And that's often how donors feel. And, and the organisations that seem to do well consistently with their donor income and fundraising are those who have developed a ongoing relationship that is resourced and managed well. Um, otherwise, you'll find that like a friendship, if you don't invest in it, it will eventually peter out. And so it's the same sort of principle that you need to do, is you need to continue to invest in those relationships. And and I would also, keeping in mind that there are some of your organisations, I understand, are probably very small, 
And um, uh, it's that's why if you can find some champions who can help do some of the work for you. In other words, people who are connected closely to, with the organisation. They might be volunteers, um, but if you build into them, they can then build into a wider circle of people. And so it just helps take the pressure off a little bit off you having to do everything. Um, so if you can find like a, a, um, an advisory group who can support you and can then be your eyes, eyes and ears and voice to other people to become supporters for the, for the gardens. Um, that's something that I would really encourage you to think about um, how, you know, about setting up small groups of people to represent you. Uh, so within the um, public programs area that I work in, we often support Nick and the foundation team in terms of building relationships with donors. So it might be that they have a particular interest in a plant that they'd like to go and have a look at or magnolias are their favourite thing and we can take them out in a buggy and show them the magnolias. Uh, sometimes it's about giving them more information about how their uh, money has helped us deliver school programs. So it might be that they come and actually watch a school program and we look and that we look after them or organise for them to have morning tea with someone in horticulture that they need yeah. to speak to. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions at this point? I know we've been answering questions as we go along, but are there any burning questions that you have or anything that we haven't answered? in terms of fundraising. I think um, in summary, the sorts of things that Nick has been encouraging you to do, you have mentioned that volunteers can help maintain relationships with donors. Other tips for gardens who don't have fundraising staff? Well, all, all staff can, the same as volunteers, can help maintain relationships with donors um, yeah. yeah look I, I think it's it's it, it's a really difficult position and i can appreciate that um but if if you want to um uh develop fundraising um i think it's important that the staff as a whole um own own that and that you come together and say okay we've all got our, our normal jobs to do but how can we each do a little bit in the fundraising sense to help connect people to our gardens? And so that's that's the approach I'd take rather than saying, how can we make money from them, is how can we connect people to our gardens? And I think that in some of your day-to-day -day jobs, you're probably connecting with people anyway, particularly if you're horticulture, you have horticulture staff who are out there in the gardens. So I would, I would encourage you um, to look at how all the staff can work together to connect with people. And so some examples that uh, I think I might have mentioned earlier, one is just having small information events. Um, just invite the local community to come along to talk about horticulture or talk about botany um, and, and see what happens. Sometimes you just got to try these things. Um, and, uh, and, it's, and, and it's always good. You start small and you just keep on working it, keep on working it. and this is how all how, how all fundraising organisations started. They had to start somewhere, um, and usually it's the case exactly what you've um, pointed out, Liliana. They didn't have fundraising staff, but the existing staff had to find a way. And um, but I would also encourage you, where you can, to try and engage volunteers um, because they can be a wonderful source of of bringing other people in. Um, what we find is that. Uh, if a volunteer asks someone, um, <laughs> it's really Asamina. Oh, sorry, Asamina. <laughs> um, it's, it, it, if, if, if a volunteer asks someone to come in and support the gardens, it carries a lot more weight than if a staff member does. And that's not to say a staff member can't, but if you think about it, once again, it goes back to that recommendation. If you get a recommendation from someone who isn't hasn't got any vested interest in that organisation, other than they love the organisation, it's a much stronger engagement point. So that's why I'd really encourage you to look for those people who are connected to your gardens right now, uh, who may be volunteers, who may be people who walk through the gardens every day. You see them every day. Why don't you go up and chat to them and say, hey, 
I see you here every day. You love the gardens. Would you be interested in, in, in helping us out? And it's sometimes it's just simply asking people that question. Um, but I, I would always emphasise the point, you're trying to find ways to connect people to your gardens as the starting point. Okay, great question, Asamina. Okay, so I was beginning to wrap it up by summarising the key points. So from the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria's point of view, if I'm summarising Nick correctly, our key philosophy is creating relationships with our community for the long term. Hmm. It's about finding ways to connect them to the organisation. I've heard it called friend raising. So you actually put your um, effort into developing relationships and contacts and the money will follow. We've talked about ways that you can find other small amounts of funding available through government or by working in partnership with local community groups. And that a lot of the key to it is finding either individuals or organisations that share your values mm. and aspirations. And I'd add one other thing too. Fundraising is not easy. And it's more so when you haven't got dedicated staff to it. So I can really appreciate that. But what I found, perseverance. And if you can share your passion, passion goes a long way. Um, if you can demonstrate the passion that you have for your organisation to other people, it becomes infectious and people gravitate to that. So I, I can imagine that you, you are all very passionate about what you do because that's been my experience of people who work in gardens. They're very passionate. Share that passion and I think you might be pleasantly surprised how many people get drawn to, to your, your passion for, uh, for the work and the organisation that you work for. Okay. So Asamina has asked one final question which is any tips for finding matched funding uh, your friend raising good one Tamar um, and is it worth for applying for funding that you know is not the full funding for your project gosh I've had experience of that Do you want me to talk to that yeah. okay uh, yes so mostly in Australia to get the small amounts of funding that I've been talking about. So, you know, enough money to run a volunteer program or a play group, you often have to find matched funding. Um, we often have to say, if you give us $5,000, then we'll put $5,000 worth of resources to the project. So I've never had to say we have $5,000 in the bank, but I've had to say that we would put you know, 100 hours of a particular staff member to a project and their salary and the materials that they will use will add up to 5,000. So that's the way that we've had to do matched funding. I have once gone for funding knowing that it wouldn't be enough to cover the whole project. And that was because, it was, and it didn't work. <laughs> that was because a community group that we were working with locally had um, they had 10 bids in for funding across a number of different government and government agencies and philanthropic supporters and it was almost like um, how in England if you buy a house you end up in a, in a chain of a whole lot of people selling and buying houses one domino had to fall and then all the others would click into place uh, it didn't work out and that's my only experience of it we we just weren't lucky enough to get the big funding and all the other smaller amounts of money were contingent on getting the big funding so i guess we had to make it clear to all the funders the strategy that we were putting in place mm, mm. so it was it was clear to all the organizations that we were going for big funding from government and that their funding would pull them into this larger partnership. But unfortunately, while we would have been successful almost with all of the smaller amounts of money, we didn't get the big piece of money and therefore uh, we didn't get any anything. But that's my only experience. Um, what, what I'd add to that is that uh, sometimes it can be a, a good strategy, if you like, um, to, to encourage more funding and um, so that uh, in our case, an example would be 
um, go into government and um, um, they will often ask us, uh, have you got any private support for this? So if we can then, uh, for this project, so if we can demonstrate that we've got some private support, and it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same amount, but just, just that we've got some support, the government will then come on board. Uh, and the same principle can apply sometimes with individuals. You'll have some individuals who be, will be prepared to pay us, uh, donate a certain amount um, if we can um, find other supporters who will provide, um, you know, uh, make up the rest. Um, and so sometimes you can use it as, a, uh, if you like, to leverage more support. Um, uh, so, uh, you, you know, I, I understand that at times it can be difficult if you can't get that total amount, but if you, you know, if you think about ways that you can use what you do have to get more, there are opportunities out there and people quite like the idea of, um, of being part of a group of supporters who are coming together. Um, and so I think it sometimes is how you, how you, you tell that story and saying, you know, this is a community of people coming together and we have this much and we need this much more. Do you want to be part of this community? Yeah. I guess, um, Asamina, another example for your question is when we were building the Australian Garden here at Cranbourne, uh, our director took the approach of splitting the project, project up into lots of smaller projects. Mm. So that um, rather than trying to find one or two donors who would put in the full forty million dollars, it was split up into lots of much smaller projects and a range of different size projects, so that lots of people could put money towards the project and pick pick the amount and the, the amount that they could afford and the place that resonated mm. with them, the part of the mm. garden that resonated with them and. That was a very successful approach. Well, as Samina, it's over to you really now to um, to conclude the webinar for us. We've had a great time. Yeah, it is. It's been wonderful. Thank you for including us. Yeah. Hello, everybody, again. Um, thank you so much, Sarah and Nick, for sharing all your experiences and really giving us a very diverse um, aspect of uh, fundraising in your garden that uh, is applicable to the Australian context, but is also transferable to other countries around the world. I really liked uh, what Nick said about uh, the fundraising, that it's about um, maintaining, rela no, maintaining relationships with donors like a friendship and that uh, you need to think about how we connect uh, people to our garden. That kind of uh, showcase a very genuine um, uh, value we need to uh, have uh, for our fundraising efforts. And me personally, I'm very passionate about fundraising. It uh, makes me think uh, uh, when, I, when I work for, uh, for my organization. Thank you so much from, uh, from Greece to Australia. Yes, Thanks, Thanks Asamina. <laughs> Thank yes, you, everybody. Bye-bye.